So I got into museums about the age of I think it was the last year of university. I had worked in a museum as a sort of summer job sort of thing when I was younger, but I, I, was, I was sort of set on joining the Navy to go and see the world because I was growing up in rural Wiltshire, which in the 1980s, early 90s, trust me, not much going on. <laughs> But I kind of rediscovered my love of, of, of you know, I'd done a history degree and I found that I rediscovered my love of, of museums and um, I suddenly had an epiphany that I was looking at, uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was, it was history, having my hands on this thing, I was holding this thing, it was, you know, I forget about reading it, here it is in my hands, you know, and I kind of got into it and it kind of brought it to life because up to that point it had just been textbooks. So um, this this would be my uh, my last year of university. I really did pull my socks up, and I got that two one I needed in, in order to um, get into a museum stu uh, studies course, a master's level. Um, now uh, back then, it was a good thing to do was to get a year out, a year out of work experience. So um, I did uh, I volunteered in various museums in my locale. Um, I, I met my future wife whilst doing that, <laughs> and then I got together enough work experiences, and um, I got some money together. I got a job as well, and that sort of thing, um, to go off and do a heritage studies course at Nottingham Trent University as a master's. Um, I went with that one because it was a bit more um, practical and vocational. Um, at that time, you, you did sort of practical vocational ones. There was one at Manchester and there was Nottingham Trent, but there was also the, the, the and I still think it's the leading one, it's Leicester's one, which was a bit more academic. And I thought, not for me, I'll go with more ethical thing. So after that, a year of that, I managed to get, thankfully, even before I graduated, I got a job in a museum in Wakefield, Wakefield Museums, data inputting. This is a, a time, folks, when computers were new things and all the digitization of collections had to, somebody had to key it all in. So that was my first job. And on the back of that experience, I then got a job in Portsmouth Museums um, as registrar, which was basically um, working with the collections, digitizing the collections. Uh, where are these collections, logistics, where things are going, loans in, loans out, research around things, and like that sort of thing. And I had had an interest in military history. Portsmouth's got a lot of military history, D-Day Museum, that sort of thing. And after seven years there, um, I saw a job opportunity here over here in the Russell Coates, and I went for it, and uh, that was 2007. <laughs> and I've been here ever since. But the collection here is incredibly diverse, and the organisation has changed several times, so it doesn't feel like the same job every... <laughs> Every three or four years, something seems to happen and we change again. But uh, yeah, that's where I am now. And as curator, uh, they made me curator, I'm responsible for the, obviously, the management of the collections and that sort of thing, but also their intellectual uh, components. Um, I help with exhibitions. We have an exhibitions team um, and I'm part of that. I, you know, obviously do a little bit of the old social media, but we've got some new specialist who's much better than I am. <laughs> uh, anything. I mean, it's, it's such a wide-ranging job. I can be, I can literally be cleaning toilets, 
or I can be checking pest traps to make sure we haven't got any nasty you know, in, insects around, or I can be talking to the, you guys, or I can be talking to donors, I can be, talk, you know, of, you know, I can be doing lectures, talks, that sort of thing. So it's a, uh, you know, or just hitting the database and putting in information, filing. It's a very, very varied job. I mean, van driving, lift, tail lift operating, uh, picture hanging, which um, is fun when they're small, but when they're enormous. <laughs> so it's a very wide, wide ranging job. But most museum jobs often are. The story starts in 1835 when both our founders, Sir Merton and Annie Russell Coates, were born. Uh, he was born in Tetanor, Staffordshire. She was born in Glasgow. Um, they met in Glasgow when Merton um, went up north to, to get into business. Cutting a very long story short, <laughs> hey, uh, he had a gap year. He went to Argentina. <laughs> and uh, came back, they got married, um, and he was, a, he was a salesman, and her dad was in cotton manufacturing, and they developed, he always had a love of collecting, and they developed a love of travel together, uh, so they, um, they went to travel the world, they collected, ob wherever they went, they collected objects and art, they grew wealthier and wealthier. Then in the 1870s, they took a punt and, um, on uh, buying the Royal Bath Hotel, which is next door to the museum now. And that was a genius decision. Uh, they never looked back. They revamped the hotel, which was at that point the only hotel in this up and coming seaside development that was Bournemouth. And they made it into the uh, last word in luxury and fine dining and uh, the art was used to promote the hotel, which is quite a rare thing, um, as far as I know. They use their art and collectibles to, to sort of, as a visitor attraction to the hotel, as well as the beach and all the rest of it. Um, after running the hotel and living it above the hotel for quite a while, um, Merton decided that it would be nice to have a retirement home built. So they secured this plot of land next door from the, from the local landowners, the Merrick estate, who still own most of Bournemouth, and um, built himself or themselves a dream house, which here we are, um, which they moved in, um, moved in 1899, 1901, they moved in. And um, right from the get go, they were sort of inviting people in on high days and holidays. Uh, <laughs> pay four, four pence or whatever, and you could come in and see the art, and Merton would show you around. I think it was like it's the first Wednesday of every month. And being philanthropically minded, um, they'd already paid for various things and campaigned for various things. They came up with the idea of giving their collections to the people of the borough of Bournemouth. Um, but they realised that uh, building a museum, as we understand it, with you know the pediment and the columns and all the rest of it was not going to happen, so the the house was built to show the collection. So they included the house in that gift. Um, so they signed that off in 1908 as a deed of gift, which is a living will, where um, both Annie and Merton put their names down as signatories. Um, when the last one dies, and Merton Annie dies in 1920, Merton dies in 1921, pretty much of a broken heart because they were desperately in love with each other, life partners sort of thing. And it came to the people of the Borough of Bournemouth. The first curator was appointed and he, he, he spent six months just cataloguing the collections and uh, getting the place up and running as a, as a museum. And then later on, they did, the Russell Coates had built these two art galleries at about the time of the First World War and the family, uh, their children chipped in and they built another two art galleries on the end uh, and then, so, so <laughs> there we are. Um, if you look at the Royal Bath Hotel now, it's an enormous building that fills up the entire block. It started as a tiny little building, not much bigger than a 
a large house. And that was because they could reinvest the profit into the hotel, make it better, keep it on the cut line. I mean, they had their own brand of whiskey, they had their own brand of cigars. They had rooms for you to put your servants in. So you had rooms for your servants, you travel with your valet and all the rest of it. And it was the lap of luxury and they were in the right place at the right time. And they just, they just completely minting the money. Um, celebrities, they made sure celebrities came to the hotel, so they had all the big Victorian names, you know. I mean, Albert King of the Belgians stayed, um, Ellen Terry stayed, Hen a Victorian actress who um, actually made it into the world of silent film and sound film. Henry Irving, Oscar Wilde, artists in Millet, that sort of thing, all these big names, politicians, and a lot of what you would call just wealthy, powerful people, <laughs> you know, the, or MPs and lords and aristocrats are all staying at the at the hotel. And of course, that draws other people of a slightly lower section down. And like I say, sad to say, we don't have the, the financial records, but it's quite clear that they were making a large amount of money. And then they were reinvesting that money in the hotel, but also buying art. Well, um, well, Merton, I mean, he's obviously a man of his age and space and time. Um, he's also obviously somebody that's um, thrusting his way up from very low middle class to obviously knighthood. So he, it's rather like sort of Chinese middle classes now. They want a book. So you have Mrs. Beaton's cookbook. Is, yeah, it's not really a book about recipes, it's about a book about how to behave as a middle class person in a changing you know, social environment. How do you hire servants? How do you manage them? How do you manage a household budget? If you don't know, then it's the same thing. In Merton, when it comes to Merton and his art, he's very much received wisdom. He reads the newspapers, he reads the art press. And in those days, people would go and see paintings like people go and see movies now. So we'd all be familiar with um, Etty's latest painting or, you know, Monet, uh, not Monet, but, you know, any other Victorian artist, any artist would be familiar with their paintings, Holman Hunt, that sort of thing. And they would be critiqued and written about and you would be expected to know. You were also expected to go to the Royal Academy and see it, all that sort of thing. So Merton sort of plugged himself into that establishment of modus operandi and all of his paintings are by people who are in the Royal Academy or on the waiting list for the Royal Academy. He likes artists that are art teachers but he does like a little bit of controversy, but it's got to be safe. Remember, he's, he's, he's using these paintings to sell the hotel. So the Duchess of, of Sutherland, or for example, um, doesn't want to have cream tea and sandwiches with all the corners cut off underneath an insightful painting about East End prostitution and alcoholism. Yeah. So she's going to want something nice and pretty to eat her tea underneath. <laughs> But he, he wasn't afraid of some controversy. So we have an Etty um, you know, nude painting upstairs um, that was quite shocking when it came out. Um, so he'll play with controversy as so long as it's safe. You know. The problem is he, she predeceases him, so her hi history is quite hidden. She wrote two books um, uh, on their travels, and she's actually quite a good writer, uh, a very good writer actually. One was called Westward from the Golden Gate, which was about their 1884, 1885 trip, basically across the Far East. Mm -hmm. And the other one sounds a bit like a Bond novel, but it's called Letters from Russia, which is letters back to the UK as her and Merton visit basically what is now modern Scandinavia, all the way up to St. Petersburg and Moscow, and then all the way back. Uh, um, but we think, you know, when she dies, um, the local newspaper print, uh, printed out all of her, um, the cards that were on the flowers, and they really are quite touching. She seemed to be genuinely loved. Uh, it seems to be that maybe she smoothed off some of his more spiky edges. But I think they were a, a complementary couple. She definitely had an interest in what we would call now ethnographic 
you know, world cultures stuff. And Merton, for all of his faults, gives her full credit for everything that she did uh, in the accession register, which he, the first log of everything in the collections that the museum had, which Merton saw briefly before he died. Um, you know, he's done a massive sort of bracket around this whole set of Japanese bows, long bows and swords and spears and said, my wife personally selected these from the um, curiosity shop in Yokohama, where we were, you know, and he gives, you know, this sort of thing. And he, 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 you know, he really did sort of credit her for that sort of thing. She was very fascinated by Maori culture. Um, and we think was probably thinking of writing a book about particularly about that sort of thing, but it never seemed to have got very far. We don't have the family archive, I'm afraid that was destroyed, but it did include, must have included her journals. Did they go to New Zealand? Yes, oh yes, yes. yes. Yeah. They did New Zealand at a very interesting time when the uh, Maori culture was reacting to the white imperial rule um, and when they were realizing that they had tourists and that they could, you know, share their culture through tourism with these people um, and uh, we've had we've got quite an interesting collection on that front a lot of our world cultures collection is stuff that's been traded or is part of this repurposing of native cultures towards um, uh, you know this new changed reality so you know you your spear maker your granddad was a spear maker his granddad was a spear maker you make spears for the village but now you know the white guys turned up there's a police force and on the one hand yeah you have to do what somebody else is telling you but on the other hand the, the warfare the violence particularly in places like the Solomon Islands was endemic um, blood feuds that sort of thing when the one thing that Solomon, Solomon Idas could agree on <laughs> about British imperial rule is the Indocene warfare stopped. And then they end up with a whole bunch of other problems. But what it does mean, what it does mean is that spear makers and weapons makers had to repurpose their crafts um, for a different market. Um, and you see that across the globe. I mean, a very good example is Japan. So the emperor, the Meiji emperor, um, has overthrown the Tokugawa shogunate. Um, the emperor's in charge now, we're going to westernize, we've opened up. Um, but all these sword makers making the samurai are dis, dis, um, was displaced out of society, but there's no need for swords, there's no need for spears. So these craftsmen turn their attention to making other things. Now, sometimes they make swords and wonderful things for the export market, but sometimes they start making vases and things like that, you know. So you've got to. And our collection reflects that change because Annie and Merton were going around the world shopping at this really important time in, in, a, in global history. So the uh, Americans had arrived off the coast of Japan in the 1850s, 1850s, um, and forced the shogunate, the military government of Japan, to open its borders. 200 odd years previously, they decided to close their borders to all sorts of outside influences to keep the population under control. And they didn't like this whole Jesuit priest business. Um, and literally, they put a dictator out that if you were abroad in Japan, from Japan, you came home, they would execute you on the beach. <laughs> any foreigners had to leave or would be executed. They hunted down any of the um, Jesuit priests that were left and got rid of them. They weren't very keen on Buddhism either, the shogunate. They were more into Shinto. Anyway, they just wanted outside influences gone. The Americans turn up, force them, force them to open up to trade. Because obviously, if you head uh, westwards from... <laughs> Well, if you keep going from America and across the Pacific, eventually you'll run into Japan. So there was the nearest sort of trading point to them. Um, they, the Annie and uh, Merton sort of turn up just as the emperor's been restored to power. He has ch fundamentally changed Japanese society. Samurais are out. Um, they're not just a warrior elite, but they could also be in right and they'd have got government functionary jobs. I mean, they, they are gone, they are gone. Um, and craftsmen are having to, like I said earlier, having to adapt to this changed world. The French have come and built rail. Well, we're building railways. The French are building railways. The Americans are giving them weapons and, they, and armies, and they're rapidly westernizing. 
Um, so you've got a samurai class that need to make ends meet, who are out of power and literally do not have a job. They've got houses filled with treasures. So, um, and the emperor's literally decreed everything Western is in. So there were junk shops in Yokohama where you could just buy anything and everything. And Ian Merton massively switched on, like I said, got a hotel in Bournemouth that is basically just a cash machine vomiting money. So, uh, and a stunning example of, of how technologically and modern and advanced Victorian world war, what Victorian world was, they could go to the HSBC bank, and there was one in Yokohama, and on against the profit of the on credit, against the profitability of the hotel, they drew out hundreds of pounds worth of gold each and each time, and it was all done by telegraph. And then they went into the shops and they literally bought anything and everything they liked. Like we know, we touched on briefly, Annie liked, seemingly liked Japanese longbows and, and um, spears and things like that. And they bought vases and all sorts of things. Not so much with the fabric. We think that they might have been wise enough to realise that kimonos and things might not have travelled so well. But they bought a lot of metalwork. Um, they bought, they collect anything. I mean, they, uh, they even pinched things. <laughs> so, they went to the Japanese equivalent of a, uh, you know, um, a little chef, and they pinched the menu holders. <laughs> they pinched chopsticks and the whole. It'd be like somebody coming to Bournemouth with unlimited wealth, and today, and then getting everything from, you know, a, a car, a brand new car, through to a McDonald's burger box, putting it all in a shipping container, taking it to the other side of the planet and putting it in their, in their hotel and go, wow, look at Bournemouth. And then that's the idea, that's what it was. So they, they developed a room in the hotel, which they, um, the Japanese drawing room, and they filled it, literally put tables out and they just hung the stuff on the walls. They had lanterns and things on the ceilings. They had the suits of armor all over the place, swords, musical instruments, you name it. They even collected sweet wrappers. And they would let, um, if they liked you, you get a special invite, and we've got a couple in the collection, beautifully um, printed, you know, engraved invites, and you would be, you'll come in and, 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 and appreciate as a connoisseur this stuff, particularly if you were a member of Japanese society, like Merton was, you know, you come in. And we know the first curator of the museum, Richard Quick, was a member of the Japanese society. Merton, we think, headhunt, pretty much headhunted him out of the Horniman Museum to come and be a curator here. Uh, the significance of the collection is because it's been over here. Meanwhile, in Japan, we've had two nuclear bombs, a World War or two, earthquakes, tsunamis, a lot of stuff they've lost. Um, it's also, if you've ever been to Japan, uh, particularly in the some more tropical region, ferociously hot and moist. And that's not good <laughs> for the long term care of collections. If you're not careful, it'll get soggy, it'll get mouldy, and it'll rot, you know. So um, a lot of this stuff just didn't survive, uh, but it has survived over here. So when he was alive, old Edwin Longston Long was the, um, was an RA, of course. He was the most expensive accommodation going. You know, to get a portrait from him, you're gonna, you need some cash. The problem was when he died suddenly, French Impressionism had come in, like I mentioned earlier, and nobody wanted to know his stuff. And so um, Merton stepped in and bought a, num a large amount of Long's paintings for probably quite a knockdown price. And he'd hoped, he hopes that I think that these paintings would increase in value well, they never did. So <laughs> he ended up being with us. That's why we've got the largest number of long paintings of any, any, uh, any collection anywhere, really. The other interesting thing about Long is he became very rapidly associated with the empire, not because he painted paintings that you know, bigged up the empire. We've got some of those in our collection, a lot of people do. Um, it was more the fact that if you're building a parliament building or a colonial office, somewhere in the empire you, there was a tendency to go and send some of the lads around back to london 
and let's have a go at the uh, let's get some good art to go on the walls of our you know um, lovely colonial building. And at the time when a lot of them were being built, particularly in India, you know Edwin Long was your guy. So that you'll we get contacted by people going, oh, there's this one here, and it's from Maharaja's palace, or it's from you know it's over in Australia, or it's over in Canada, or wherever. It's because when they were building these buildings, this art was deemed to be good and the sort of thing you should have on your wall. So it's sort of an odd thing again, where Bournemouth is a it's an epicenter of something that's quite diverse across the globe. Um, one of my predecessors, uh, Mark Bills, wrote. No, the second of the only two books that have ever been written on Edwin Long. And the first one was written by Richard Quick, the first curator here as well. But he's an interesting artist and, like you say, not, re- you know, not really appreciated. I think it'll take more time for his work to, sort of, to be understood. Having said that, um, his Egyptian paintings, of which we've got a couple, um, we've got a couple of prints, and we, you know, that he put out at the time, and we've also got obviously Anna Domini and uh, another one, um, the sermon the sacred ibis. I, they're very interesting because they show obviously the Egyptology was coming. It wasn't long, much longer before people, you know, Howard Carter discovered human farms too. So there's a lot of interest still in, in Egyptology, based on what Napoleon had been doing and what he discovered in the desert, but. Um, Egyptologists find the paintings really interesting because they show how um, what people thought Egypt looked like at the time, and it's a color. They're often color. Obviously, the paintings are the color images, and so the colors, the use of colors that artists have used reflects on you know various things about what they thought things should be like. Also, um, you know, they were sketching things and that sort of thing. So it's it's sort of a, a rather like the war art thing we were talking earlier. It's a color image where you know, photography is only still black and white or sepia. So yeah, there is, he is a fascinating artist. Um, but I, I think his, his time will come. It hasn't come yet, but his time will come, I think, as time moves on. Find the people. If you're dealing with you know, archaeology, it, it can look like a pile of rubble on the table in front of you. But if you find the person, you'll un- unlock the meanings of the of the object. I also think, from a, um, a you know from an activity point of view, it's about people. We put exhibitions on for people. I mean, here at Ross of Coates, obviously, we rely awfully on ticket sales and that sort of thing. So. You know, it's got to be popular. That doesn't necessarily just because you're popular doesn't necessarily mean it's, you know, or even populist doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. You know, it's about, but you, you know, we kind of take a friendly approach. I think don't patronise people. That's a good one. <laughs> um, and be open-minded and share. Share. Don't. The temptation can be that this is all, you know, I found out all this information about a painting or an object or whatever, and I know, I don't see why anybody else should know, and I'm going to hoard it all to myself, and I'm going to be a little weird and introvert. No, it's about um, sharing that information with people. What's the point of having it, having that painting on the wall, having that object, even if it has to stay in store, because it can only come out in certain conditions and environmental stuff. (laughs) What's the point if you're not sharing it with people? Um, after all, in a sense, they're paying for it. <laughs> it's taxpayers, in a sense. Um, you know, so I think it's about, it's about people and engaging with people, whoever they are, wherever they come from. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I do enjoy the challenge of somebody who's like, museums, blah, 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 don't want to go. And I'll, I'll see that as a challenge. I'll you know, get in there. And, and the questioning approach, don't dictate to people. Don't go, rah, 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 yeah. You know, ask them the question. Get into it by questions and dialogue. Try not to be, you know, um, sat on a pulpit, you know, shouting down. The thing about museums is like restaurant service, right? You notice, we don't notice when your food arrives perfectly and on time and cooked to perfection and the, the drinks that you ordered are there. But my goodness, you notice it when it's wrong, don't you? 
it's like that. It's like anything. There's a lot of work in getting something that people don't notice. And I kind of like that challenge too. That um, they notice the flaws, and they will notice the flaws. And the, the great British public are brilliant at telling you when you're wrong as well. But I think in the past, yes. But that was to do with issues about um, you know funding and culture of the time. I mean, I'm, my training, I did my museum training in, what, 1999, 1998, 1999. I mean, I know that stuff is, is 20 years out of date, but I mean, some of the principles hold true. Uh, and it's about engaging with people, not being dictating to them. And then some museums in the past do, but that's because it's issues around funding. And once you've set up a building in a certain way and you've got labels on the walls and certain habits engaged and embedded in structures, it can be hard to change. Um, but yeah, in the past, I think now museums, you know, we really have been in the last 20 years. You know, I'm in the museums, I went around with the kids. It's like, oh, really? Do we have to go? Can we not go to Alton Towers, please? <laughs> no, you're going to enjoy some enlightening stuff. But um, I'll always find, no matter how uh, stuck in the past, shall we say, a, a museum might be for whatever reason, and I don't usually blame the staff, but it's usually issues outside of that museum's uh, control. Well, I will always find an object that I engage with. Yeah. So we pride ourselves on the Nutter Coast, so, you know, it's a free form space. There aren't many display cases here. You know, people can have encounters, great close encounters with objects. We don't want them touching them, but we don't want to put glass, too much glass in their way. Um, but unfortunately, we've had to put a, uh, a one-way system through the building, which is working and is quite minimal in terms of disrupting the visitor experience. It does sort of correspond to the way people naturally move around the building. But it, it does mean a lot of signs, unsightly signs as well, you know, and that's the thing. And then um, the shop now looks like a <laughs> post office, you know, a kiosk with all the perspex and things like that. Um, obviously, the man, it's now you know, mandatory for people to wear masks in the museum, the visitors and that sort of thing, when they're visiting us. Um, the staff, at the moment, masks are optional because obviously, in, in a sense, the visitors are entering our social bubble, not the other way around. But I mean, I have, I have um, done various, you know, I've got various appointments where I've got to go and see people about objects. So obviously, I'm going to have to mask up and that sort of thing. And we've risk assessed. The risk assessments are insane. You know, they're really de detailed type of stuff. But we're slowly opening up again to volunteers and, and our, you know, volunteer teams and things like that. Because of the nature of the collections, the nature of the building, we've been somebody's been here every day, all day, um, since lockdown. Really, it's just so it wasn't too much of a step to open up to the public again. We hadn't, unlike some museums, completely mothballed. We were still operational, um, but yeah, it has it has put some restrictions in. We've had to. Um, finally bite the bullet about digitization. You can't have room books, you can't have informa information panels that people can pick up. So we've gone, uh, we're going towards this thing called Spot, um, Smartify, so I almost said Spotify, Smartify. Um, and we've been putting a lot of information on our website so people can access it through their phones. And um, I think that has been the kick up the jacksy that perhaps we needed to do. We don't want a museum filled with little labels everywhere, you know, because you'd have to explain everything. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, people do need help to unpick some of this. Um, and it kind of goes with the, the aesthetic of the, the interpretation aesthetic of the house is sort of as Annie and Merton would have known it, and they wouldn't have had labels on everything. So the, the, having it, all that information on the phone is great. And of course, the phone, in a sense, is infinite in its depth. So you can go quite shallow, or you can take people very deep if they want to go that way. If you're doing that in the real world with, you know, paper-based solutions, so to say, and you've got to have panels and labels and text and green books and things, yeah. So we're feeling our way through it. Obviously, there's cost implications. Um, 
you know, X thousands of pounds gets you, I think it's like 500 objects. Obviously, we've got far, far more than that, but it would mean an extra cost. So um, it, you know, it is frustrating, but it, there are reasons for why things are the way they are. Um, but yeah, it, it, the digital frontier, I think, is, is you know, it's given us that push towards that. I was very skeptical of it, but um, now I'm a convert. Like somebody's given up smoking, I'm now all about that, you know. <laughs>